being in college, I was still in college when I started and I moved out of my fraternity house. I lived with a couple of buddies. And the first thing for me was like, I'm around all these young people who still want to party, go to bars every weekend, have fun. I, I didn't want to do that. I was like, my goals are more important to me than that. And that's why. A lot of people ask me, hey, can we split up the deposits? Can we pay in different things? Friday, everybody. Facebook, soon to be YouTube. What's happening, everybody? Yes, what's up, guys? What's up? What's up? What's up? There we go. I got the notification now that I know that we are live. The bing for sure. Hey, how's it going, guys? We are the AZ Flip guys. That is Cashflow Chris. What's up? I am Cashflow Creator. We are just two ordinary guys doing extraordinary things, talking about real estate, mindset, and everything in between. And man, dude. Today's uh, guest is somebody that I personally haven't met, which I know is a little bit, um, a a, you know, a little bit weird because I normally know everybody. Yeah, like, fuck, right? I, I know everybody. So, <laughs> so anyway, I haven't, I haven't met him. I talked to him a little bit. Um, I, I talked to him a little bit here earlier, but um, he was just an awesome, awesome guy. So we're having him join over here, but. This guy was able to build an empire of passive income and he realized that he needed passive income and actually turned into passive income at the age of 23. So before the age of 23, actually, our buddy over here who just joined us. So we got, we got some people joining us here. Let me, give me one second. Let me put this on the watch party. So anyway, guys, if you guys are joining us, live make sure that you comment make sure that you let us know where you're at give us give us some love over here if you guys are if you guys are watching us on a podcast if you guys are hearing us on a podcast if you guys are watching us on a replay if you guys are hearing us on a um on youtube make sure that you download this this uh podcast so if you can find us on itunes you can find us on podbean you can find us on spotify Everybody. Make sure that you download this uh, this podcast. Make sure that you give us a five star review. And if you're not hearing this show live and you have any questions, make sure that you put your questions or comments on the comment section, wherever it is that you may be doing it. We always go back and at some point re uh, respond to to those questions that might be there. But if you are live, and it actually re let me rephrase that: if you are listening to one of the recordings here and you want to join us live, make sure that you join us live every single week. At Friday at noon, every single week, AZ Flip Guys. So Facebook.com backslash AZ Flip Guys. Every Friday at noon, Arizona time, we have our show live where you can actually come, leave your own comments, uh, ask questions. Uh, it, it's just, it's always, always an amazing time. Yeah, we got our regulars. We got Celie in the house. Armando, what's up, my man? Yeah, yeah. And of course, Sonia Ray. Woo! Our usuals, we love them. Yes, yes, we do love them. Uh, so, yes, we, we have all of our folks here. Uh, let me see. We got um, – no. all right, perfect. I just want to make sure that we were live on the on the call right there. Perfect. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, so how you doing, David? What's up, David? I'm doing great. Are, are these working? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you just Sweet. fine. Sweet. You never know with these AirPods, you know. Sometimes <laughs> they're a little finicky. <laughs> nice. So where, where are you at? Where are you at, David? I am in Michigan right now. Um, it's kind of odd timing because I'm packing God up. Damn, I'm you baby trucks. face, motherfucker. God damn, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I do look young, don't I? Fresh out the pot. So fresh so clean, <laughs> Dude, nobody, uh, yeah, I'm a little different. So I'm 20. <laughs> How old are I'm gonna you? I'm going to get ID for the rest of my life at bars. I'm 23. Okay, yeah, because, yeah, you definitely, I would definitely ID the fuck out of you, just so you know. <laughs> I would, too. <laughs> I would ID the fuck out of you. I'd be like, uh, -uh I don't believe That's you're funny. at. Right? When That's I first funny. started, uh, <laughs> when I first started in real estate, I went to this meeting, and one of the guys that was up on stage speaking, he said he was 30. Motherfucker looked like he was 30. Like, he just oh, yeah. had, had baby yeah. face. He just, he was just one of those people that looked just a lot younger than they were. So, anyway. That's you, me. We have you here. We're excited to to speak to you because of, you know, basically we, we talked about it here a little bit ago, but you were able to build an empire over 500 units so far, and you are barely 23. Man. That, that is, is 
fucking amazing. Now, we have a few different people here joining us. I, one of the people that I saw that was joining us was our mentor, Mr. Jeff Fagan. Uh, and basically, he one of the things that he teaches us, one of the things that he really pounds in our head is passive income, passive income, passive income, mm-hmm. passive income. So uh, I, I just I want to applaud you before we even get into your story, before we even talk about anything else. I just want to applaud you for recognizing the value of passive income at such a young age because that's Pretty just brother. something good. like we go to meetings where we we know motherfuckers 50 60 years old they're like oh shit yeah man <laughs> you know what that does sound like a good idea maybe <laughs> they, money with that they idea. wish they, they wish they started you know when they were exactly they were well and, and that and that that's what happens and i'm sure you know i have a nephew who's 18 who said he wants to get into the business he's like i want to learn real estate i'm like perfect Bring your monkey ass over here. Let me show you how to network, right? Hell yeah. <laughs> Go exactly. network. And, and initially, he was like, well, you know, I'm kind of young and, and I'm not sure. And what are people going to do? Are they going to take me seriously? And I'm like, motherfucker, not only going to take you seriously, they're going to pat you in the back. and you're They're going to pat you on the back. That you probably heard, David. I'm, I'm almost, I, I will guarantee my left nut yep. that you have heard this many, many times. Oh my gosh! I wish I would have started when I was your age. <laughs> oh my gosh! I hear it every day. <laughs> I got to say, guarantee you my life. You get a lot of people that, dude. You get a lot of people as a safe bet to make. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of people that, uh, um, you know, that will help you too. Being so yeah. young, getting business, you're 18, 19, 20, and you want to get in. It's a lot of people that like giving back and helping out people that are younger. And if you're ambitious and you're willing to actually put some effort in and not just stick around, you know, people will help you out. So exactly. Oh, sure. And that, that's what I was telling him that it's, it's not, it not only is it not a, a crutch against you, but it's actually a benefit because I started networking when I was in my early twenties. And the one thing that I heard all the fucking time is I wish I would have started when I was your age. I wish I would have started when I was your age. I wish I would have started when I was your age. Everybody in those networking events were somewhere Always. in their forties, fifties or sixties. And they were like, I wish I would have started when I was your age. So for yeah. those of you that don't know who you are, including myself, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've accomplished, and then we'll get this, we'll get this party started. Sure, yeah, man. I want to help as many people as I can on here. I appreciate you guys having me again. Um, so I guess my story is not too long. You know, I haven't even been here that long on this planet. So uh, I, started, <laughs> I started when I was 20. And I was listening, you know, like everybody, I was listening to the Bigger Pockets podcast. I was listening to podcasts like your guys. I was reading books. And for me, uh, it really kicked in when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And uh, I was studying financing, college. And at the time, it just, it made sense to me. You know, real estate, it just makes sense. Why, why wouldn't you get into it? The longer you uh, are in it, it's, it's really not that hard to create a lot of wealth over time. Uh, even if even if you're not going really really big, even if you buy a couple of rentals, you can create a good amount of wealth over time as long as you get into it at some point, right? And then I heard somebody tell me, I said, "Don't wait to buy real estate. Buy real estate and wait." Yes, and yeah, busy, yeah. I was like a sweet saying. It just made sense. I was like, "Why not? Why not just get into it now?" So, jumped into um, single family. Uh, at first, I thought, you know, I don't have any money when I started. I started with nothing, and for for me. Uh, it was the obvious path to so get how, it. how old were you when you started? I was 20. I think I was just 20. turning 21. Yeah. So and I started a wholesaling. Okay. Now, what, what was your family telling you at this point? It, you, you said you went to school. Yeah. Were, right? were they like, were they pushing you to choose a career? Were they choosing you to choose your degree? Uh, you know, I, because I'm sure, I mean, it's happened to most people. A lot of parents start make it tough on people. Yeah, they really do. Mm-hmm. Um, so my, mine were super supportive. I, I think I'm really lucky that they were supportive. I are started my first when I was 13. What's that? Are your parents entrepreneurs? Uh, my dad's a dentist. He owns a dental practice. I guess it's, yeah, somewhat of a business yeah. owner. I mean, yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Awesome, and, awesome. Um, but for me, you know, I, I started my first business when I was 13 years old and they kind of pushed me to do it. They're like, if you want to buy a car when you turn 16, which I did, they're like, you got to work for it. You know, mm-hmm. we're not just going to give you a car. So um, they, they were like, why don't you start mowing people's lawns? So I did that and I kind of got addicted to it. And I ended up kind of having every, everybody's house in my whole neighborhood. I was mowing everyone's lawns. I bought a big zero turn mower and 
started this little landscaping company. So that was my first venture into working for myself. And how old, how old were you at that time? I was like 13, 14 when nice. I started that. Like yeah. Car. Yeah. Which I know a lot of people do that when they're young is landscaping. Well, and you know what? what's crazy is that I've, I've been working since I was fucking 12 or 11, somewhere around Hell that yeah. frame. But they didn't, I, I was taught, go get a fucking job. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it, it was, sure. you, know, you want to make some money. This is how you make some money. You want, you got to go pass out these flyers door to door or whatever the fuck yeah. I was doing back at that point. Uh, it wasn't installed in me, but you know, luckily for you and, and honestly, you know, still, even there's a lot of people that have those, you know, I don't want to make it sound like, oh, well, you're only here because your dad was a dentist. Uh, the reality is that there's a lot of people that have the same opportunity that their parents were also business. Absolutely. That never yeah. fucking do anything. I could have yeah. easily gone 20 different paths, you know? So, so, so yeah. your parents, your parents weren't really pushing you to follow a certain road. They just said, do, do what you want to do. And then when you decided. No. It, yeah. It, it I actually bounced around a lot. I first, yeah, I first went to college. My first year was a pre-dental. I thought I wanted to be a dentist. Okay. And I decided pretty quickly that wasn't me. I wanted to, I wanted to be in business. So I switched to business and I ended up a uh, sophomore and early my, my first semester junior year. I did a couple of internships for um, some investment banking firms. I did a little auditing and consulting for a big four uh, accounting firm. And I decided that, you know, that was kind of tested out to learn. And I thought I was maybe going to do that for a couple of years, save up, buy some rentals. I still wanted to do real estate. You know, at this point, I'd, I'd, I'd wanted to get into it. And I thought that was what I was going to do is go get a high paying W2 job, make some money and invest that into, into real estate until I could get out of it. Um, I got I got so into it, though. And I'd saved up maybe like ten thousand dollars from from one of these internships that I was like, you know, fuck it. Why don't I go out and just try this? Let me dive in. Let me try and get into real estate full time and see if I can make it happen. Worst case scenario, I go back and get a job. You can always get a job. There's jobs everywhere if you work hard enough. Um, and hold on, so, hold on. Time, time yeah. out real quick there, David. Guys, uh -huh. listen to what the fuck he just said. He said, I am going to go try it. And if it doesn't work, I can figure something else out. Yeah. And there's a lot of times where a lot of people reach out to people like Cashflow Chris, people like myself, and I'm more than likely people like David and say, you know what? I've been thinking about going into real estate. I've been wanting to get into real estate for fill in the fucking blank. How many fucking yeah. years? <laughs> exactly. Out there? How and, many excuses? And they yeah. never do it because they're afraid as to what's going to happen. It's you know, I have one of my mentorship students and, and, you know, I I've said it before, I don't mentor people in real estate. I mentor them in the mindset, but one of my mentorship students was talking about, uh, he wants to grow his business and I'm like, we'll start fucking borrowing money. Uh, I don't know if yeah. I do that, man. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm like, well, what happened? Well, fucking it, it ended up that he, what's he the worst thing that can happen? That. You know? Exactly. Well, that's what I told them. What's the worst thing that can happen? You lose the money. You got to work your ass off to pay these people their money back. Well, it started over. That he had borrowed money from somebody a while back. It didn't work out, but he worked his ass off, paid them back their money, and everything was fine. So I'm yeah. like, all right, you just showed yourself that. Plus, you most likely learned a lesson when you did that by failing that that actually propelled you moving forward. So kudos to you to do it. And guys, once again, for those that you're watching live, for you guys that are on here, uh, we do have a watch party going on. So we, uh, if you guys are on the watch party, we got Johnny Sanchez who's saying he's a boss. I do agree with you. That, that's definitely something that a lot of people aspire to do, especially at such a young age. But if you're watching on one of our uh, watch parties, make sure that you comment on there. It doesn't show up on the main thread. So make sure that you comment, you put your questions or comments. But for any of you guys that are watching us live, guys, I, we're talking to a 23-year-old who owns more than five hundred units wow. most of you motherfuckers haven't even started your goddamn wholesaling fucking career well i gotta pick a business you can't do it without a business <laughs> yeah man you gotta get the right you gotta get the logo together you know they gotta pick out the logo that's valid right <laughs> but, but you know what you know what everyone goes through that right and you figure it out because that's how when i started all those things seem like they're important to me and 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 a lot of people to what you were saying before uh, BP, there's, there's so many failures that go into successful people, right? They don't, for you guys, nobody sees behind the scenes how many times you guys have probably failed to get to where you are. And some of the wealthiest people in the world, nobody sees the million times they've failed along the way, right? They just see the success. So 
if you're not afraid to fail a little bit, you're never going to make it anywhere. In my opinion. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that people don't understand is yeah. that failure is a part of success. It's just yeah, it is. You should start enjoying a little bit of failure. You, you know? can't get there till you get to the other problem. Now, you 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 said that you were um, you decided that you wanted to get into real estate, and you said, "Hey, if it doesn't work out, I'll figure something else out," which is mm -hmm. something that I highly suggest for, especially when you're young. When and you can move you know, back when you're a little bit older, you have to say that oh again. Gosh. When you can, when you have the opportunity to maybe live with your parents or whatever, have a roommate yeah. and you can live for cheap, dude, do it. Absolutely. Do it because what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. So do I had, yeah, I started my, I started my real estate career back in 2006. At mm -hmm. this point, the bubble was going up. I made some mm -hmm. money there. 2007, my shit started crashing. By 2008, I was back working at corporate America and I, you know, I, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, fuck this shit. I'm never going to do this shit again. And I just quit my job. Now, at this wow. point, I started um, I started putting out banded signs. And I said, you know what? I want to get it back into real estate. I want to get back into real estate investing. And everybody thought I was crazy that I quit my job because I was going back into fucking real estate. They was like, this, this is insane. This is the worst time to go. And I said, you know what? If it doesn't work out, I just blame it on the fucking economy. What do you want me to do? It was a bad economy. Like, shit. Yeah, well, yeah I, was, I was an idiot for doing it. God damn, whatever. Then you go back and get a job. I'm a fucking genius. Exactly. So you, once again, I kudos to you to seeing this ahead of time. So you decided, hey, if I, you know, if I take this chance and I want to get into real estate, if it works out, awesome. If it doesn't, then fuck it. I'll go find something else. So what was yeah. your first experience in real estate? What did you do initially? Yeah, so I got out of those jobs. I like it was the last day of my last internship, and on that day they gave me a job offer, and I turned it down on the spot. I said, "No, I'm going into real estate." Um, and then I got out, and I started every day. I wanted to, if I want to first wholesale, and I think I, it was so funny because I, you know, I'm, pa I'm packing a move down to Austin right now, and I went through and I found some of my old journals where I wrote my goals. And I have these stacks of uh, notebooks where I wrote my goals every single day, like what I wanted. And, and it was so funny. The first one I think I wrote, like, I want 10 apart, I want 10 single family rentals by the time I was uh, 25 years old. And then I started thinking bigger and bigger. And, and this is like a month or two into when I started doing real estate full time in mid to end 2016. I wrote, I want 100 units by the, uh, within a year and I want 500 units within three years. Wow. And then the three years is actually coming up in like 15 days. And I just hit it, hit that goal uh, Monday. So it's just crazy, you know. I so I that was part of the beginning. I started setting lots of goals. That's right? awesome. So we got uh, we got a few uh, we got quite a few people here joining us. Uh, we got Felix Corral. We got Anthony Thomas. We got JD. We got Robert. We got Melissa. We got people up, everybody? comments. We got people asking questions. We got Benjamin in the watch party. We got Melissa Hall here tagging some of her friends. And guys, once again, we tell you we don't pitch shit. We don't sell shit. If you guys find this valuable, do us a favor and share this on your page. Share this on your group. Share this with your friends. If you think that somebody can get value, if you think that somebody can get inspiration, if you want to put a fucking pat your son in the back and be like, hey, motherfucker, look, you don't think it's possible. Look at this. Look, look at this kid. Look at how old he is. You know, if you want to show somebody what's going on, tag them on the comments. Let them know what's going on. We got um, we got a lot of people over here. Uh, one of the people are saying, um, let me see, we got Sonia. She said, if you're not in it, the best time to do it is now. Right. And that's one thing that you realize is that it was might as well get started now. I, I think it was uh, I think it was Warren Buffett or one of those motherfuckers that said, when is the best best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When's the second <laughs> yes. best time to plant a tree now? <laughs> get on it. Yeah, really? Tomorrow. Not, not tomorrow. So you realize that you realize that you needed to get in there now. We got somebody yeah. here, Reed Bellamy, who's saying that their biggest problem is funding. And I'm assuming that they're talking about multifamily. I'm assuming that they're talking sure. about getting into multifamily. And honestly, a lot of times people have that issue getting into any aspect of business. Oh, sure. Just yeah, like I don't have any money. And, I don't know. Like I told my, my mentorship Please. student, borrow the fucking money. So yep. <laughs> what were you saying? Yeah, there's a lot to do it. And I, and I can talk about that. I mean, so I didn't start with, with any money at all. Like I said, I had saved up like 10 grand and I knew that was going to last me like six months, right? Because I moved it back home with my parents and it was going to last me, you know, pay up, pay for my car and my food and, you know, insurance and whatnot while I struggled to get into real estate. 
And I did a couple wholesale deals and just realized like, dude, at the end of the day, that was a day, that's a day job again. Mm-hmm. I'm a, if I stop, if I stop flipping houses or wholesaling in 90 days, my income stops. Yeah, buddy. And for me, that was like, and, that, and that's a great realization. You know, I, I didn't have that realization to me. I was like, fuck, I can make a $5,000 check, a $10,000 check. And just by making a few phone calls, like, fuck yeah, sign me up. But I didn't, I that was cool. so, I was so ingrained in you have to trade time for money that to me, this was just a better way to trade time for money. This was a way for me to make the most amount of money with the least amount of effort, but I still needed to trade time for money. It's something that I didn't realize. And then once again, man, I probably said it a few times, but kudos to you for realizing at such a young age. You know, it is time for money, even if it's like a wholesale. You know, a lot of us will spend literally a half hour on a wholesale, make five, ten thousand bucks. Like that's a really, really high. That's really high. Per hour, yeah. You still have to put in that hour. Exactly. You have to be here. You can't be. And well, follow. and and Rhett, uh, we'll, you know what? We'll what we'll do is a little, little bit later on. We'll get in. We'll get it into it with David about how he does, how he finds his financing, how he raises the money for his apartment complexes. Yeah. Because uh, as we do multifamily ourselves, we know that the biggest uh, the biggest issue is finding the money, finding the investors. Uh, sure. Some some people have. Some people have that issue. Some people have the other issue, which Sealy over here is saying, my biggest problem is finding big enough apartment complex. Yep. So, so it, you know, it all depends on who you are. It all depends on your network. It all depends on your skills. Yeah. You're going to find one or the other. So we got, um, we got Sealy who's saying, I'm an expert at failing. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know good, what, man. Sometimes that happens. Uh, Sealy. I'm gonna. I think every entrepreneur is. Well, and, and I'm gonna put you. I'm gonna put Seely on the spot, and I'm gonna use David a, as an example. So Seely is. Uh, fuck, I don't even want to guess wrong, but you are retirement age. <laughs> uh, I would say. I would, days, yeah, literally. exactly. If I if I was guesstimating, I would say you're somewhere in your mid sixties or so. My ass, my ass. So anyway, <laughs> the reason that I'm that I'm bringing that up is because. At that point, you start programming yourself. Society starts programming you. And then you start kind of getting into these habits. There's a book that I love called The Compound Effect. And it talks mm-hmm. about there's an example where this, where this uh, sensei is taking a student out and trying to teach him an example about changing your habits, changing your roots. When you're doing it at such a young age as David is at the age of 23, those roots haven't cemented yet. So in the example, the, the, the teacher tells the student, hey, you see that little seedling? You know, can you pick it up? So the guy picks it up with two fingers and, oh, yeah, sure. Oh, can you pick up that one that's about, you know, a feet tall? Sure, he picks it up, yanks it up. Then he's like, oh, can you do this one here? It's about, you know, two, three feet tall. And the kid was just struggling to get it out. And then he looks at this really big oak tree and says, hey, can you get that one out? And he's like, fuck that. I can't do it. <laughs> now, when you are at the age of David, the younger you are, the easier it is to pull that. The older you are, the more cemented it has become in your life. So even if you realize that you don't need to make a change and it was five years ago, you still have all that other time that has cemented you into where it is that you are currently at. So great, great thing over there. And Celie, once again, I want you to understand this. Um, I, I was actually, I just spoke at an event here a few days ago and my topic that I mentioned and I'll find a way to put up the video at some point. But anyway, every master was once a disaster. Oh, yeah. We got the video. You know, of it. Every master was once a disaster. Every person that is now doing something with their life was not doing something with their life at some point. Some people figure it out, like our boy David over here at the age of 22, 20, fucking amazing, amazing. Some people... Like there's you people, you know, there's that meme that went around for a while about the the Colonel, Colonel Sanders with KFC, how he didn't come up with that idea till he was like 65 or some shit. He had failed the whole fucking time. You know, oh, what's wow. his name? Uh, exactly. the, the dude from McDonald's, mm-hmm. um, Ray, Ray Kroc. Kroc. He, he, Kroc. Didn't, he didn't fucking start dealing with McDonald's till he was like 55 years old. Yep. He was a 55 yep. year old milkshake salesman. So crazy. Anyway, kudos to you, but Sealy and anybody else watching, anybody else listening on the replay, anybody else listening on the podcast, it doesn't matter where you're at right now. Just Agreed. a few different little changes because you started in real estate when you were 20. 
Mm -hmm. You said, you, yeah. Damn. So in three years, you know, you were able to scale up. Yeah. Now, guys, it might have been, you know, you may not be him, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible for you. Now, David, we got a bunch of apartment guys in the house and they're all, you know, even though they're buying apartments just like us, we all want to know how you scaled up. So one of the things they wanted to know, you know, how'd you get started? Did you start small? You know, how did you scale up? How did, how did you get to that 500? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't think, no, I've never, I've never owned a single family rental. I did a, a, a few brief flips and like whole, like wholesale slash flip type things. Uh, and then I wanted to get into apartments because that's when I realized it's just, you know, that's the long-term vision. I'm going to make a lot less money in year one and year two, maybe year three, but year, you know, after that, it's going to be, it's going to be golden, right? I just knew it was, it was like a patient thing. And just, I need to not worry about getting fancy and yeah, I can go do it. 10, $15,000 wholesale check. And that's awesome. But in the long run, is that going to get me to where I want? So that's, that's why I decided apartments. The first one I bought was a 12 unit building. It was in like a C, maybe C minus area. Um, I just had made the decision. I'm not going to do anything else, but, you know, but buy an apartment building until I buy my first apartment building. That is my sole focus. That's all I'm going to do. So I started reaching out to brokers locally. Um, I actually got some lists and was cold calling people uh Hold and on. i time the fuck out hold the f god god damn it guys you see what he did it's the same he thing said, as wholesale this, this is same. Oh, no. well before that before that oh, yeah. said, i got one fucking go and i'm gonna oh, only yeah. focus on one Dude. fucking thing until i get it done all you Dude. motherfuckers out there that always tell me come up and say oh you know i want to get into multifamily one day well you know when you're gonna get into multifamily when, when you, you focus focus God damn Dude, it. So anyway, focus you is so powerful, bro. Like focus is, I preach this every day. I run yeah. some pretty big social media groups and focus is the number one thing I talk about because if I was trying to do both, I guarantee you, I might only put, be putting like 20, 25% into each category. If I'm, if I'm going in all, all in on one, I'm going to get that full hundred percent out of my attention. Cause it well, takes not so only much. That, but you're going to get distracted by the big checks. Yeah, you're going to be like, this Absolutely. shit over here isn't making me any money right now. This shit is making me money right now. Let me focus on the thing that's making me money. Now I can do a few more things. But man, kudos to you for just being disciplined enough to be able to be focused. Man, holy and shit. You, had the, you knew that you weren't going to make a lot of money up front. And a lot of oh, people, yeah. you know, partners, they don't even think that. So knowing no, that, yeah, I, accepting that is huge. Well, yeah, I mean, so you got to you got to really think it's a long term game. It's not if you want to get into apartments and do it for a year, you're not going to make a lot of money. I mean, unless you maybe go and wholesale a small apartment building. But I mean, good luck doing that. It's much more difficult than doing it on a uh, single family. So you just have to really be patient and understand that's going to take a lot more time. Um, and, and I could have maybe made six figures my first year as opposed to making like 20 grand my first year in real estate. Mm -hmm. 15 20 grand because i just knew i was like it's worth it it's, in the long run it's gonna be worth it it's gonna be worth it i just kept telling myself that and, and honestly guys that's a great tip on how you can just stay consistent one a lot of times people don't um so i i the for you guys that follow me on my social media so you can follow me at cashflow creator on instagram uh you guys can see that i like to go hiking early mornings and i do a, a sunrise hike so I wake my ass up at the crack of fucking dawn before the sunrise. I go to the mountain. I show up and I walk my ass up. Now I'm walking up. It's not the easiest thing. I mean, you're, you're walking straight up a goddamn mountain. Uh, one of the things that I have to constantly tell myself is it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Once I get up there, the view is going to be worth it. Once I once the sun starts peeking behind that mountain right there, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Yep. So man, that that is a great great tip over there. We got a lot. Dude, we got a focus. Oh, man. We got a lot of fucking comments here. What's up, how David? many people do you have? How many people do you guys have watching right now? Uh, we got forty one people watching. Forty two nice. people right now. We got like Hell thirty yeah. or so, so comments. We got all kinds of shit. We got Elizabeth saying, "Hey guys." We got Josh Cashel saying, "That's what it takes." We got Ma Maya here saying, "Whoa." We got uh, our boy <laughs> Osiris saying, "The the power of setting goals. The power of goal setting." Man, uh, we got uh, oh, it's crazy. we got our girl Elizabeth saying a greetings from HTX from uh, Houston, Texas. Houston, yeah, yeah Houston buddy. America. And actually, I'm speaking of uh, really speaking not. of Elizabeth Navarrete, she was actually a guest on our show two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, she was two weeks ago. weeks ago. So I'm actually going to be appearing on her podcast. 
coming up uh, on Wednesday. It's going to be on the Propelio channel. Propelio. So, yeah, so you guys check that out. It's David, going to be amazing. we got to hook you up with Propelio. They definitely need to talk to you. And then we got another guy, Steve Trang, who has a runs a great podcast. So we need to Hell yeah. Help no, I appreciate out. that. That'd be nice, awesome. Nice. Oh, we got our buddy Justin Smith in the house, man. Justin yeah, Smith. Justin. I haven't heard it yet. Hey, Justin was asking about you earlier. I'm, he's one of our fellow multifamily guys. We got here somebody asking – about your acquisition story. So you you said God, we're at twelve now, these, right? Huh? So we're at twelve units. Yeah, yeah. So you, you found right. twelve unit. Well, hold on, hold on. Oh yeah, you, we don't even know how he bought yeah, it. Yeah, you you found it through networking, which is yeah, something no, that we fucking say all the goddamn time. And speaking of networking, we got Mister Networking himself, Greg Cook is <laughs> in the house. <laughs> Batman. Yeah, yeah. Greg Cook is one of our. <laughs> That's awesome, you know, Greg, but uh, Greg Cook is one of our. Um, uh, one of our regulars here. God damn it! I wanted to say naturals. I knew that was. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's one of our regulars here, and one of the things that we preach all the time in our show is network, 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 network. People are like, "Dude, where do you find your money? Networking. Network. Where do you find your deals? Networking. Where do you find so your deal? Networking." So, um, David, where did you find your first 12 unit apartment complex? <laughs> Dude, networking. It's the networking. key, man. It's Holy the key. Shit, networking. So you networked with a broker, if I heard you correctly? Yeah. So, so just like in single family real estate, multifamily real estate and commercial real estate, there are brokers that specialize in those areas. So there are specialist commercial brokers that do just apartments. Some of them actually focus just on smaller, let's say under a hundred units. And some of them focus just on bigger ones, hundred units plus. Mm -hmm. So I started talking to a couple local firms that focus more on the smaller side of things. And 12 units was a little, a little small for them. They probably mostly do 50 to hundred units. But um, so I, I, I just said, you know, I was bugging them for a couple months and I just said, Hey, send me some deals and they come your way. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I, I, had, I really, I probably had no right saying that too, because I didn't have money lined up. I didn't know where I was going to get the financing, but I just, I just talked to him on the phone and I told him, I was like, dude, I'm young, but you give me a chance. I'm going to take down a deal. And okay, whoa, 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 whoa. hold on, bro. I, yeah. I fucking love you, man. You got a lot of really gold nuggets. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot here and I'm, you know, I'm just letting you know is we're going to constantly stop you because for people like okay. that just kind of live this shit, we say sure. stuff without even fucking noticing. Right. So sure. you, you talked about, you said, Hey man, send me these type of deals, these other stuff that I find. He networked with the right people. He networked with people that had the shit that he wanted. And I say this all, all the time, guys. The easiest way to get drugs is not from a drug user, it's from a drug dealer. And what I mean by that is in real estate, if he would have been going after the fucking seller, the, the homeowner himself, that's the drug user. That motherfucker always got a limited amount. He wants the drug dealer. He wants the motherfucker who's out there slanging this shit. So he said, hey, let me put on my big big boy pants over here. Let me throw, let me grow these big old gorilla balls and let me just tell them with no money, with no resources, with no connections, send me what you have. Yep. Guys, you just make the call. You just, just make the call. The call. Exactly. Thank you. You took the words out of my mouth, David. It's just, just make the call, man. The call. So and 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 and, and figure out the rest later, right? I mean, I, here's the thing: a lot of people want to get into the space, they want to buy apartments. What's the first thing you got to do? You, you don't, most of us don't have the money to buy them right away. Most of us don't have the bank lined up. Banks, you, they don't give pre-approvals in apartments. They underwrite the deal. They underwrite the sponsor, you, but they underwrite the deal. It's more, more so than single family. You're not going to get a pre-approval. So until you find a deal, you can't do all the rest of that shit. Yes, you should be networking for investors along the way constantly, and that we always are. But until I find a deal, I don't start raising money. So how did you, so, which is fine. Uh, yeah. And, if, you know, there's two schools of thoughts. There's well, I'm always raising people money. Say, hey, money. you know what? I'll, I'll raise the money when I have the deal. If your deal is good enough, you'll raise the money. The second half is, hey, you know, you're better off raise, having the money there ready. And then. Well, you know, I, I do a hybrid. I do a hybrid, right? So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm always raising money. By, and by that, I mean, I, I'm constantly driving leads to my website, talking to people people through social media, finding accredited and sophisticated investors, setting up calls with them and building relationships and just saying, hey, I'm, I'm out looking for these types of deals. Now I have a track record that I've bought and sold and got some really good returns to investors. So I've got a track record now that I can say, hey, I've done this. Uh, but I'm always telling them, you know, I'm looking for this type of deal. I provide some passive cash flow along the way to you. 
you know, if you want to put in fifty or hundred thousand dollars, what we is what we call a syndication, and I can explain so, and that. We'll, whole, and we'll we'll talk about that here in a minute. We'll talk about that, yeah. yeah. So but we'll, it was we'll, we'll get to there eventually. So uh, before before I ask you how you actually funded your first deal, we got Alexander here who's saying just closed my first wholesale deal, doing sixty five k this week. Uh, then I see 23 year old with 500 units. He's all bar has been raised tremendously. That Dude, is that's what's awesome. Up. We got Justin Smith who's talking about build your networks and the deals and the money will will come, which is something that you were saying, and that's something that we say all the time. Network, 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 network. Where do you find your money? Networking. Where do you find your deals? Networking. Where do you find your connections? Networking, 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 networking. Hey, I want Dude, to comment I'm on Alexander's uh, comment real quick. Dude, that's why you need to level up who you're around. Yes. You know, if you're yeah. around people who think $65,000 is a lot of money, that's great. If you're around people who think $20 million might, might be a lot of money, you know, now raise that bar. You got to change. Raise the bar. And, well, that, and that's a good that's point. That my, my mentor has said is if, if you don't think in the millions, you will never make millions. If you're exactly. constantly thinking in the thousands, your money, the way you think of deals is in the thousands. You're, you're going to be limited. You're only going to make in the thousands. That's because you're that's how your mind works. Uh, we got yeah. man, we got people in the watch party. We got a shit ton of people. In hey, the David, watch do you want to comment on that? You were going to have to say something. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Leveling up who you're around. I mean, that was, dude, one of the biggest decisions I had to make when I first got into this is I, I, I'd just come from being in college. I, I was still in college when I started and I moved out of my fraternity house. I lived with a couple of buddies. And the first thing for me was like, I'm around all these young people who still want to party, go to bars every weekend, have fun. I, I didn't want to do that. I was like, my goals are more important to me than that. And that's what I need to focus on. And I removed myself from all that. Actually, a lot of my friends, they probably they'd tell, they'd tell me now, like, dude, I didn't even see you for like two years during that period of time when you were nice. just starting. Because you have to remove all the, the, the wrong people from your life and only put around people that are, you know, either above you or are going to help improve your life in some way. And you can do the same for them. You just got to change the circle you're around, you know. I, I completely agree. And guys, that all goes back to networking. Who do you yeah. hang around with? Who do you listen to? Who the fuck is infecting your goddamn mind or yep. benefiting your mind and feeding in nutrients? We all have the same 24 hours. We all have the same resources. We all have the same fucking internet, but it's all who you hang around. And it was, it's one of these things that if you start hanging around with people here, birds of a feather flock together, birds of a feather flock together. I always use the example because it's funny in my head, but have you ever seen the crackhead couple? Where do you think this motherfucker met? Like, David, would you date a crackhead chick? A fucking chick out on the street who's a crackhead? Would you date her? Fuck no. Would I date her? Fuck no. Would Chris date her? Fuck no. Uh, females watching here, would you date a crackhead ass guy, bum ass dude in the street? Fuck no, you wouldn't. But birds of a feather flock together. Flock. You, you, you have to hang out with those people that you want to be. And you, yep. water rises to its level. So you always want to seek networking events you always want to see groups you always want to see different places where you can network with a lot of uh, different people and honestly man you can do that here on the, the show if you join yeah. us live every single yeah. friday at exactly. 12 noon arizona time facebook.com you want to know the first backslash az flip guys yes you have to do yeah. a little promo that's for everybody listening on the podcast and if you are listening to the podcast once again make sure that you download this episode make sure that you give us a five-star review and make sure that you leave us in the comments. But this is the benefit of joining us live, is that you can actually ask us questions. You know, we had somebody here who was asking about financing. We're going to get into financing because somebody there was asking about that. We got a Barbara a Humrick house. Hey, Barbara. Barbie, thank you for joining us. Uh, your birthday was yesterday. Love you. Miss you. You know that I love you guys. Uh, we got a Celie Hussein. Uh, she was, uh, she's 70 next year. And she's, uh, <laughs> she's got a tattoo and a belly that. button ring. Yes, she does. And we've actually seen them. <laughs> we see both of them. <laughs> we got yeah. Alma Flores. We got a lot of people in the um, in the watch party coming in. We got Ben saying, what's up, y'all? We got Anthony. We got uh, we got people tagging their friends. We got, um, oh, my God, we got people all dropping fire signs, consistency. Uh, we got all kinds of people. People saying that was a crazy analogy. I'm yeah. assuming they're talking about the drug dealing one. And they're all yeah. loving this, David, because... All the shit that you're saying is right, but God damn it, none of us knew this when we were 23 years old. So, I mean, how how do you, 
even comprehend that because how do you pull yourself away from the fun times? You know what I mean? Because people, when I was 23, we were just all about getting fucked up. Yeah, we're fucking idiots. I I just made a fucking video about this on one of my groups where I was talking about mindset. And I was talking about how fucked up it is that society tells you, hey, you need to make up your mind at the age of 17 who you want to be the rest of your fucking life because you got to choose college before you get out of high school. And I was just pointing out the fact that most people that I know, myself included, were complete fucking idiots from the age of like 18 to 23-ish, somewhere around there, (laughs) give or take a few years, (laughs) depending on the person. (laughs) (laughs) Depending on what friend I was around, right? You know, as you get older. Yeah, really. I was kind of an idiot in college, too, from, like, 18 to 20. I mean, I did a lot of stupid things. Like, everyone has fun in college, and you party. and But you just figure out, it's like, you know, do I want to keep partying and going to bars now, or do I want to be able to buy the bar when I'm 30? Buy the bar when I'm 30. God damn it. I love this guy. I love it. So, so let's go back to your 12-unit deal. You had no experience. You've never owned a multifamily. You have not enough money in the bank to even come close to buying this shit. Oh, and B- oh BP, real quick. The first, I did want to say one last thing on the circle sure. on getting around the right people. You know, the first thing I the first thing I cut out when I wanted to switch from single to multifamily. People that were I, doing single family. I, I stopped going to Rias. Exactly, because they're all doing single family. I stopped going to yeah. Rias, dude. It was like the plague to me. I don't want to see another single family deal in my life. I want to, you want to level up. You really have to like focus, shift your entire mindset. Like, so Chris will focus. tell you, um, I am a stiffler when it comes to that. Wait, are you a stiffler? Or are you a stickler? Because stickler, <laughs> stickler from the movie. Stickler was from that from the fucking the American Pie American movie. Pie was way stiff. before your time, brother. <laughs> no, <I've seen> <laughs> However, though, I do. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very focused on one thing and yes. one thing only i do i do not stray regardless of how beautiful all this other shit seems and i purposely only hang out with the people that are in that lane because i don't want to get distracted man yep. dude, once again i think i'm fucking awesome because i figured that shit out in my fucking early 30s you're fucking amazing because you figured that shit out of your early 20s dude you that just gotta listen to the people that have made it like if you just look li- because because you're telling people that right now and all these people listening are hearing it it's it's all so true just start now and and it's you know you just gotta follow the advice of people who are doing better than you we got actually speaking of somebody like so guys let me before i talk about this guy here you may be watching this video on youtube you may be hearing this podcast somewhere you may be watching the replay saying you know what i wish i could be like david I wish I was like Cashflow Chris. I wish I was like BP over here. Uh, man, I, I would. I wish I was like them. I wish at some point I, I wanted to. Now, the person that I'm going to talk about right now, he's actually on our watch party. I used to be that guy. I used to be sitting on my fucking laptop in my friend's house that I was renting a room after I lost my fucking place. And I used to watch YouTube videos. And there was a few characters on YouTube making videos about wholesaling and short sales and and flipping houses and that type of shit and one of those guys was mr Corey boatwright uh man i used to watch oh dude Corey's my boy yeah you know Corey. yeah Corey's Corey's my boy too me and him were just speaking at the finding deals summit in denver yeah he's he's Uh, awesome awesome yeah and he you know he he agrees with what we just said is your network is your net worth you know he he understands that it's who you hang around with Uh, yeah i've actually i met um I met Corey at going to a different event with our other buddy, Corey Peterson, which yes. uh, Corey has done a – Corey Boatwright did a deal with Corey Peterson last nice. time. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so, I, I, you know, I approached him, and I was like, man, dude, I used to watch you on fucking – you know, I used to That's watch you awesome. on YouTube. Like, I used to I used to sit there and watch you and your friends make money through wholesaling and shit, and it's just – you know, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you, right? And now, you know, Corey is somebody that I would consider friends. I got his phone number. We talk every once in a while uh, on here on Facebook and shit. But it's somebody that I would consider for a friend and just to be able to be there. Now, I point this out because you might be looking at somebody like David and be like, damn, man, 23 years old. Fuck, I'm whatever, whatever, whatever. But you can make it too. You can, if you, you just are- You to make the change now. Exactly. If you're consistent and more importantly- do what David was saying, which is surround yourself with the right people. That That is amazing 
that you at the age of fucking 20, 21 years old had the foresight to say, if I keep on going to these RIAs, people are going to keep on telling me about single family properties. I have no interest in single family properties. I only want to hang out with people to talk about multifamily properties because that's what I have determined to do. Congratulations, man. <laughs> that is fucking awesome. Corey was saying, "What, uh, David, what's up? He's saying, what's up? Uh, fire, uh, flip guys are dropping straight fire. You know this, you know this. So, David, <laughs> how did you fund your first deal with no experience, no, like I said, you didn't have enough money to buy this thing yourself. You, you, you didn't really have much to show for that, but you took on sure. the, you took on the, the challenge, say, you know what, send me what you have. I like this. I'm thinking of putting it under contract. How did you then go, go ahead and find, find the money for that deal? Yeah. So, so the way it happened was I, I put a 12 unit under contract and then another broker came by and had another 12 unit, two blocks down, same street. So a week later, I put that one under contract too, practically the same price. Um, so these were, I think we bought them for like 565,000 a piece right around there, 560 to 580. Uh, so it was like 47,000 a unit. I think it comes out to, and, um, for me, I, I, I have, I have my little spreadsheets that I work in and, you know, I ran all my numbers. I figured out what price worked to figure out what, how much capital I'm going to need. Uh, you know, if, if most banks are giving a 70 to 75% loan to value on smaller loans, which I say smaller loans, those are like under a million in size. Mm -hmm. um, so I figured out, you know, I'm going to need a 25 to 30% down payment. I'm going to need, you know, closing costs, another couple of percent there. Uh, I, I Basically, in the end, renovation money, I figured out I need about 160 to 170,000 to buy each of these 12 units. So um, that was Part one of my focus, I got to raise the money to buy these. Part two of my focus is I need somebody to guarantee the loan. So I brought a business partner in that had enough net worth and liquidity to guarantee the loan with me. Um, and then part three was to find a loan. So I went to several different banks, I think four or five local regional banks. Uh, and I got a term sheet. I basically said, hey, here's the financials on the property. Here's all the information you're going to need. Here's all the data. This is my underwriting. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to renovate these units and bring the rent up $75. Look at this property down the street. They're renting for 75 more. Same unit type, just a little more renovated. I, I put a business plan together, pitch it to the bank, and then they come back and they'll give you what's called a term sheet. And the term sheet's going to say, hey, we'll give you a loan of 75% loan to value. Estimated interest rate is 5.05 5 .05 interest, 25-year amortization. What, what you, what's you laughing about? Oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't. We're, we're, in, awe. we're in awe. <laughs> so we, no, we're, we're definitely in <laughs> awe of you. We were just saying we, we're, we're a little bit salty because we're refinancing a property. Uh, these motherfuckers oh, yeah. gave us a term sheet and they gave us a commitment. And then oh, they retraded? They backed out fucking last minute it's saying, fuckers, hey, we just changed our underwriting procedures a few days ago. So uh, tough That's shit. That's bullshit back. too. They know they're last. <laughs> yeah. They just. <laughs> The, the words on the email said, we are clear to close. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah dude, exactly was, that so anyway, our investor was waiting for their money back. So you you decided that, hey, you know what? And and uh, honestly, uh, I'm glad I stopped you here because somebody asked something in the in the um, watch party, in the watch party that I think is going to be very, very beneficial. Now, before I say that, Corey said awareness equals wealth. I completely agree with you. Uh, and 100%. this guy here, man, he's completely aware. So Alec was asking, how did you do it? Uh, how, do, how do you do it with bad credit, though? And the thing is, is that you, I'm assuming you had little to no credit at that point yeah. because you were that young. So yeah. and it's not just credit, guys. They it's want you to have good credit and have trade lines and have experience when you're getting in the multi. Yeah, so they look, Go they ahead, look yeah, they look at a couple different facets. So um, you know, the first the credit's one thing, yes. Uh one of the biggest things is they're gonna look for liquidity in the amount normally of ten percent of the loan amount and a net worth equal or higher than the loan amount. And those are well, when, you, when you started looking for those loans, what what was your credit like? Uh, I mean, I probably had a credit score of like 740, but there's not much attached to it. I maybe had a lease, yeah. right? And and maybe a very small balances on credit cards that, you know, I was paid off. So I really didn't have much credit at all. And um, for me, I couldn't get the loan anyways, though. They wouldn't give me a loan because I didn't have, you know, my net worth's like 
10, 15 dollars at the time you know there's nothing to me so exactly. i need to bring somebody and in point, awesome. and th that's the point that i'm trying to make here by asking you these questions here so alec yeah. how did you get in with back credit get a fucking you partner yeah. partner up with somebody who doesn't have back credit totally. you know one, totally. of, one of the things that we had uh for this refi is i had the good credit score but i just didn't have enough line of active lines of credit because i hardly use credit cards or any i don't really like financing shit Sure. Uh, and it came back and bite me in the ass when I had to try to refinance this property. So we had to get one. Of, we had to bring in a partner that had the assets, that had the liquidity, and also had the credit lines with the you know with the amounts that they that these people wanted to see. Yeah. Hey, why don't you exactly. tell us a little bit about your sponsor? Uh, you know, not his name or anything, but you know, what kind sure. of person is this? What did he need to provide for you? Yeah, so it's, it's basically like a balance sheet sponsor. We, we went in, you know, because I found him. He'd done a lot of fix and flip deals, a lot of single family stuff, was pretty successful in that area. And I knew I needed somebody that had a net worth and liquidity. So we decided to go in and buy these deals together uh, as partners. And we would, you know, oversee them and kind of just split everything down the middle on it. So, um, yeah, he, he just qualified for the loan. And that's what enabled us to, to buy the property. Awesome. So that, that's really what you need is it, I call it like a loan sponsor, loan guarantor. Yeah. So he, he, was, uh, he wasn't just a name and a credit score. You know, he wasn't just a balance sheet. So he was a little bit in the business. Yeah, with a little bit more of a, yeah, more of a business partner. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is a guy that I started getting into wholesaling and flipping houses with. Um, and he's kind of my business partner for about a year after that until we decided to kind of go so, our own way. You found a deal, you locked it up. Two deals. Well, yeah, multiple deals, but whatever. Ooh. I'm talking about his first deal. So he found the deal, he locked it up. Then he went to go look for financing. He went to go talk to local banks. Once he found the bank that would be willing to do it, then he went to to his network to find somebody that would be willing to sponsor his deal. Yeah. So we got yeah, that we got Alec here. And the reason why I just said that is because Alec here was like steps. Uh, you're just talking motivation. Well, look, Alec, let me tell you something, motherfucker. What we do here, this is called edutainment, okay? <laughs> it's a little bit fun, but you're going to learn something. So be patient because we're going to fucking get to it at some point, I promise. But that's the basic steps. He found the yep. deal. He went to go find somebody that would give him a loan. I'm um, assuming yep. that the first bank that you walked into didn't say, hey, come on in here, buddy. David, <laughs> come on in. Let's give you the fucking loan. Absolutely not. Oh, Somebody said, yeah. hey, you know what, here's what we can do, but here's what we're going to need. So he exactly. went to go find that person. Yep. Regardless of exactly. what your crutch is, you know, you may what? have bad credit. You may have no credit. You may have no money. You may not have the liquidity. You may not have the stuff that these people need to be able to give you the loan. But find someone that else does. out there does. Right? Yep. Exactly. You found, you found this person through what? What, 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 did you, what, were, what did you do to originally meet this, this person? Well, something called networking. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Networking, networking, networking. We got, we got ASAP Home saying, hey, guys. We got Giovanni saying a vision without action is just a hallucination. That is for sure. We got Greg Cook saying over here, networking, networking, networking. We got Lamont saying, hey, guys. We got people saying this is straight fire. Um, we got here uh, Corey Boltwright saying mindset. Combined focus equals lethal impact and massive momentum. Man, when you have those two, when you have the right mindset and, and you combine that with focus, which is just focusing on what it is that you want and just sticking to it regardless of what happens. In any one of these steps, and we're just talking about his first deal here, any one of these steps he could have gave up. Any one of yeah. these steps, he could have been like, well, I don't know. I'm not going to talk to the broker because I don't know. What am I going to do? I'm just going to. He could have talked. To and that wasn't even my first deal. Yeah. The first one was a 44 unit I tried to buy and I pulled out of the contract because they they hit a lot of uh, deferred maintenance. They didn't tell us about it front and they wouldn't come down to a price that made sense. So I pulled out. So I failed before I even got into my first deal. Of course. You know? And, and it's, it, once again, this is not. I tell my students, it's not even it's not even failure. It's a lesson. This is just something totally. that you learn from, and it's all how you take it, whether it's going to be failure or not. So you, but each one of these steps, you could have they they said, hey, you know what? The first bank, hey, well, we don't give out those type of loans. Oh, okay, well, fuck. You could have just stopped right there. You could have quit right there when they said, hey, well, we can we do 
provide those type of loans, but you particularly don't qualify. Okay, okay. Or, hey, well, you could qualify if you find this person. Oh, fuck, how am I going to find that person? No, that's too hard. I'm not going to do that. Any one of these steps, you could have get stopped. And this is one of the things that I talk to my students all the time. This is one of the things that I, we say on the show all the time. You need to be a person that is able to get past every single option. You're either going to be somebody who's unstoppable or somebody who's stoppable. There is no in-between. Either you're going to be able to be stopped by something or you're just going to be regardless of what it is, I'm going to move forward. So you you came in, you found the you found the bank, you found the sponsor who who had the um who had the the stuff that you needed, whether it be the liquidity, the credit, everything else that you needed for your particular deal. And we're not getting too much into the detail because every lender is fucking different. Every yeah. every bank is going to be different. Their requirements are going to be different for what they provide. But yeah. the the real point of this is that you don't need to have this shit yourself. Mm -hmm. you can partner up with somebody. Zero money down. It's not a. Yeah. It's not a lie. You could do it. <laughs> who, who brought your 160k for this, David? Yeah, good question. So, uh, and, and I can. It's called a syndication. And I'm sure a lot of people hear it nowadays. It's kind of like a buzzword. Back back when I started, this is like end 2016, beginning 2017. It really wasn't a buzzword. Not many people were talking about syndication. So, um, I essentially what that is is I go out and find a property. I put it under contract. I get a loan. You know, we have somebody to sponsor the loan. I figure out how much money I need to raise. And then I, ra I go out and raise that money from uh, uh, a number of investors. It could be, you know, really, it could be one or two investors, in which case I would just do a JV. But a lot of times we raise money from large numbers of investors. Like I just finished a deal. I closed a deal on Monday where I raised $3.6 million from 20, 28 different investors. All at varying amounts. We had one group that came in for a million. I had uh, ten people that came in for a hundred thousand, for example. You know, somebody that came in at two fifty, a bunch of people at seventy, a couple people at fifty, and we pull this money together. Where these are all uh, LP limited partners, and we have an operating agreement that outlines this, and another document called the PPM, private placement memorandum. And essentially, you're selling shares in this deal, and those agreements outline how I'm going to compensate you for investing in this. There's no guarantee. It's not an interest rate. Uh, your money is, is, is at risk if the project were to go under. However, uh, we outline the returns to investors. For example, on this first deal, I said, if you invest money into this deal, I'm going to give you an 8% preferred return on your money. And what a preferred return is, is let's say $100,000 is invested in the deal. Uh, the first $8,000, which is 8%, the first $8,000 that the property makes every year goes to the, the investors. Mm -hmm. Anything over that, we have what's called a split. And the split might be 50-50. So if the property makes 12000 a year, I give the first 8000 to that investor that put in 100 and then I get 50% of what's left over. The investors get the other 50%. And so I, I have this all built out in a spreadsheet, a pro forma, and we outline and project out what we think the returns are going to be the investors. We, we tell them what the, the splits are going to be on the income. I, I disclose the fees that I'm going to get, um, you know, and we can go into a little bit how, how I get paid as, a, as a, uh, you know, an investor putting together these deals. There's multiple ways we get paid as well. But I, I wow. go out and I find investors. And I think, you know, so let's just revert back to the first deal. You syndicated money to raise the 160 or you just JV'd with somebody for the first deal? I syndicated. Yeah, I think I had five investors uh, anywhere from 20 to 50,000 a piece. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And guys, you see, this is what I'm saying is that you, it does, my mentors and were, all the time. There were people that like, houses and stuff too. You know, there were people that wholesaled and that maybe just of closed course. the deal and an extra 50 grand and they're like, yeah, you know, let me put this aside. And, and so they invested with me. One thing that everybody um eventually realizes some people don't realize it as early as you do but eventually everybody realizes you need cash flow badly yep and preferably passive income yep preferably passive cash flow now you still need cash flow but preferably something where you're not physically passive. working and this so is the most passive form of that yeah, exactly. it really so you you put together a you put together a syndication, you put together a PPM, which is a private placement memorandum, and basically that just said, hey guys, we're raising this amount of money, we're using that as a down payment for the 
for the apartment. I agree to pay you this way. Here's what your interest looks like. Here's what your split looks like. Here's what everything is at. Who is interested in loaning me money? Bye. Exactly. Exactly. And I'll go out to, uh, I might have to 25 people on that deal and I had five people say yes and 20 people say no. Um, and, and that's just kind of how it goes when you start. I know after I did those two deals, the next equity raise I did jumped up from 160,000 to 1.7 million on my third whoa, deal. Whoa, and 10X, just like that, huh? 10X, man. And that was the most challenging thing. I'd Up to this point, that was probably the most challenging thing I've ever had to do. I think I called like 200 plus investors and I ended up getting 25 people to, to put up, you know, 1.7 million. So. Wow. Love it. That is awesome. That is awesome. And that's one of the things, guys, that is persistence. That is not giving up. You call 200 and something investors. No, 25, right? To five, get 25. five out of 25. So that's like what? 10% no. out of the people that you talk to? Yeah. Yeah, really. It's like 10%. That's insane. That's that insane. Was tough. It wasn't easy. <laughs> now, was that first deal, that first 12 units, was that local in Michigan? Yes, local. So it was about 25 minutes from where I grew up and live. Gar okay. Town called Garden City. It's a sea area, nothing to write home about. Not a place I'd, I'd want to live, but, um, you know, it's good rental market. Did you buy the other 12 unit next door as well? Yeah. Yep. So I, I actually went under contract on those almost within the same like week or two weeks. And I closed on them within a week or two weeks of each other. So those were, it was kind of, you know, I threw two together at the same time. And that was a little bit of a challenge, but I had the same bank give us a loan and I had some of the same investors on each deal. So. Yeah. And I, we got Ben over here saying creative for sure. Scared money doesn't make money. The risk exactly. is worth the reward. Uh, There's more people than in think. the business. There's a lot more people than you think that have 50 or hundred thousand dollars sitting around and they want to put it to work, you know? Yes. And that's, that's one thing that I, I you know, that's one thing that I tell people all the time is that usually the people that you think have money don't and the people that you don't think that have money do. It's crazy. And, and it, right. it's crazy right. because we're just, we're programmed to be, you know, to have this perception of what people with money look like, what yeah. how people with money act. But when you start dealing with investors and people that actually do have money and actually it's have totally money to invest, so this is somebody, yeah, this is somebody who didn't just have 50K in their account and was going to live off of it. This is a, this is something that they're actually just investing, so they don't particularly need that money right now. Yeah. But that's and I won't. And I won't yeah. take anyone's. Money. If it's your only fifty thousand dollars, I won't. I ask people that before they invest with me. If it's your only fifty thousand, I don't. I don't want it because I don't want that mental burden. And uh, you know, I want people who are willing to put money passively in a deal, and they don't need it back within the next five years. Because typically, our whole time three to five years. So. Hey, David, I wanted to comment on one. So we have a comment here from John. John says, creative, risky, but he's confident. Now, I, I want your take on this because you're an investor. Uh, by definition, it's not risky. You know what I mean? What, may, what about uh, multifamily investing kind of takes a lot of the risk out of it, uh, opposed to other people who are just speculators? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, the first thing is you could play – with stocks and the stock market and all that is just value right so that value can go away and be wiped out in a second we saw a lot of that happen in 2008 2009 same thing with real estate but the reason i do multifamily as opposed to single family is because there's economies of scale there if you have a single family rental and your tenant leaves who's paying the bills mm -hmm. it's you if you have a 12 unit apartment building i could have three four tenants leave before I have to come out of pocket, right? Maybe five if you buy right or six. So I, I look at it as, as hedging. The more units I have in a property, I'm hedging more risk. Uh, and I think, I think it's the safest form of real estate you could buy apartments. Everyone, people always need a place to live if you're buying in the right markets. I buy in primary markets. I don't buy out in the middle of nowhere. They've got to be growth areas. And, and you know, we buy where we are, are confident things can appreciate over time and properties that we can add value to something I can go in and take from being worth 6 million up to 9 million. Right. So not turnkey. And I think a lot of those hedge against the risks. 
For sure. Love it. Where, what direction are we going to head now, BP? Oh, so we got a lot of questions out here. Oh, uh, yeah. So, you know, a lot of it is just going to be coming to the same thing. Uh, usually it comes to the same shit. Where do you find your properties? Where do you find your money? Sure. How do you find these deals? How do you find this money? Uh, we do have somebody saying 3 point, uh, 3.6 million. Nice. That's a great, great raise at the age that you're at. So you, you said something that struck a chord with me is something that I have found. Uh, on, on our end too, which is as you start proving yourself, it, it, people start kind of taking you a little bit more seriously. You know, people start kind of listening to you a little bit more where mm -hmm. initially, you know, obviously you have to prove yourself. So oh, yeah. you, you started with this 12 unit property. You went from raising 160 to 1.6 or whatever that was that you were raising on your next one. How did that transition go where you're like, hey, you know what? I I feel confident enough that I'm going to lock up this property where I need to come in with $1.6 million down payment. I feel confident enough in the people that I know or, you know, however I'm raising my money that I'm going to be able to do that. Do, do you want me to kind of tell the story of how I found that property? I think a lot of people, it's, yeah, it's kind please, of interesting so story. Going to that. Um, so... I bought those two 12 units and I was like, okay, next goal. I want to go a little bit bigger. I want to do something 50 plus. So I got a list of apartment properties locally here in Michigan. And uh, I, I did what a lot of people do for wholesaling and flipping. I put together some mailers and I sent out two or three rounds of mailers to these apartment owners. And it's a little more sophisticated. I didn't do a yellow letter. I just did something on a, on a professional letterhead that said, hey, I'm interested in buying apartments. I see you own this property. Give me a call if you want to chat. And I had a guy call me uh, on a 96 unit apartment building. And um, he was 71 years old. He built the property 40 years ago and owned it free and clear. It was his oldest and smallest property. And the guy owns now over a billion dollars in real estate. He's 71 year old, a local guy in Michigan, extremely wealthy had no reason to call me and, uh, and talk to me. Uh, however, we kind of kicked it off and he liked me. He's like, dude, you remind me of myself when I was your age and I'll give you a shot. Oh, man. So, Come on. Guys, that's all it fucking takes. Look, I say this shit all the time, especially for the young folks. Oh, well, why would somebody want to help me? Motherfucker, dude, you, first of all, you don't know their situation. You don't know who they are. You don't know where they're coming from. This guy that you're talking about, he may have had a kid who's got no fucking interest in real estate. Probably. My 16-year-old son has told me, and Chris has heard this multiple times, <laughs> I'm not interested in real I'm estate. And I'm, real and, estate. I'm not, and I'm not trying to force him or <laughs> yeah. do real estate. Like, I don't, whatever, whatever he wants to do. But at some point, I'm going to want to pass this on to somebody else. So I always, I always tell people this example. You know, the people that are like, oh, I don't know. Well, why would they talk to me? Hey, imagine you are 65 years old right now or 70 years old and you are at the point of your career that you want to be, whatever that is, you know, you're successful, whatever your definition of fucking success is. And some guy, some kid, some girl, whatever, in their 20s comes up to you and says, hey, I really look up to you. I, I like what you're doing. I want to do exactly what you say. I'm, I'm here to listen. I'm here to pay attention. You know, would you please just, you know, can I just get a little bit of your time? What are you going to, what are you going to tell them if that was you? Are you going to tell them to fuck off? Right. Probably yeah. not. And if that person tells you to fuck Some off, of them do. probably Some of them do. Not be dealing with them anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, you, no, so you met right. this guy, you, you, you send out some letters to local, um, to local people that owned apartment complexes. He actually had built quite a, quite a bit and, and had, had been doing this for quite a while. You guys set it off and you guys started, you basically, you, he took a liking to you. Yeah. But you, and wouldn't, I, and have, I, you wouldn't have done I, that I without taking a little bit and even talking with him, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I built myself up too. I was like, oh, I just bought 24 units not too far from here. Um, you Perfect. know, I've got a lot of momentum. I've got some goals. I want to buy a couple more, a couple hundred apartment units this year. And, I, you know, I, I love this property. It's not far from where I grew up. And, uh, you know, I, I love what you've been able to do. Like, give me a shot you know, and he, he just, he just liked me. So we, we ended up negotiating, we struck a deal. Um, I bought the property for 4.2 million. 
that equity raise I was telling you was the hardest thing ever. It was pulling teeth. I had no track record. I hadn't bought, I hadn't sold anything and like proven that I could get people, you know, return on their money yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't managed a property that big. So I brought in a partner, um, the same partner that I had in 12 units. And then I brought in another partner who owned about 3000 units locally in the area. And he brought in some of his friends for a couple hundred thousand. And then he sponsored the loan. Um, once you get over a million dollar loan size and a stable property, you can get what's called an agency loan. And these are uh, loan government sponsored loans backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, whatnot. So I got a Freddie Mac it's called a Freddie Mac small balance loan. You could look it up and get some more details on it. Uh, we raised 1.7 million. I convinced the lender to allow me, my partner to self-manage it, uh, which was a little crazy because we were only managing the 24 units at the time. And we closed on it. I uh, planned to do about $500,000 in renovations, which I GC'd the whole renovation process. And oh, man, uh, you're glad for yeah. the punishment. And, and yeah, now a year. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it was terrible, but it was a learning process. And, and, and the next thing I did was I moved into the property. Once I bought this, I was up to about 120 apartments and I decided, you know, I want to learn property management because that's going to be big for me going forward. The best way to do that is to move on site. So I had a full, I have a full time on site um, manager and on site maintenance person. They're salaried. They make about 40,000 a year and they work, you know, full time on, on site there in the leasing office. And uh, so I oversee them. I run the back end property management software and I really just dove in and learned that business. And uh, I bought it in September, 2017. We're all in for about 5 million with the renovations. And i just went under contract three weeks ago to sell it for 6.7 million. Nice. Oof, man, that's so Robert Kiyosaki of you. You know what I mean? Kiyosaki always talks about, you need to know a little bit about how everything works. So yeah. you're going to get in, you're going to know how property management works. You're going to know yep. what to expect from people. That's, that's brilliant. Exactly. And that's been huge. So we're going to get our investors a little over a 30% IRR. It's like a 70, what's 80%. That? What's growth. IRR? So IRR for anyone who doesn't know is it, it's, um, it's um, basically a metric, like a growth rate on your money. It's almost like an annualized return, you know? So it's almost like you made 30% a year on your money. Right. Because yeah. you're taking into account, like they're going to be making, you know, six, eight, whatever your pref is. And then in mm-hmm. the back end, when you count it all up and divide yep. the years, this is your return, right? And, and here's the thing, our, the, our sponsorship team that put that together on this one, we did an 8% preferred return and a 70-30 split. So investors get 70% of profits over that, we get 30%. So we have $1.7 million in profits of which my team gets 30% of. That's where we make our money. Along yeah. with the upfront acquisition fee that we charge, and that's two percent, three percent of the purchase price. So you know, there's a couple of different ways you make money along the way. Now, one one of our uh, viewers was asking, are these value adds? Was were the twelve uh, unit value add, and then was this big one a value add? Yes. Yep. So the, this big one was a huge, definitely a value add. We we renovated about forty. Well, no, we're about we're at about unit thirty five. We didn't finish yet um, because we just got this offer and we decided to sell it. So. Yeah, we've renovated 35 units. I replaced the remaining three of the roofs that needed to be done. I fixed all the carports. We did all new carpet and paint in all the common areas and hallways. Um, yeah, we renovated those 35 units. We did uh, vinyl siding on all six buildings. I was like 150 grand to do the siding. Wow. Um, but, but we improved the property enough to the point where, you know, we got the, net, the income up. We got our, kept our expenses lower and, and, what that raises is, is uh, uh, a metric called your NOI, your net operating income. It's basically your income minus your operating expenses. And that doesn't include your debt service or your loan payments. And what happens is in commercial real estate, the value of property is not like single family where it's based on, you know, three bed, two bath in this area. You know, it's got brick siding, whatever. It's based on the NOI, your net operating income and a, a, a metric called a cap rate, which is based on what market you're in. So how, how that works is, let's say my net operating income, let me just keep this real simple. Let's say my net operating income is $300,000 and I'm at a 10% cap rate. That's, that's a really high cap rate. Normally it's gonna be more in like six to seven right now um, where, where this property's at. But 
$300,000 divided by a 10% cap rate puts the value at 3 million. If I can take my income up enough and keep my expenses low enough to where I can get my NOI up to 400,000 and I'm still at a 10% cap rate, that pro the value of the property now went up to 4 million. So for example, we bought it. I'll just do some quick math here because I think it's impactful. Uh, we bought it. The NOI was like 325,000. We bought it for 4.2 million. What's that? That's at a 7.7 .7 cap rate. We brought the NOI up to 425,000. And because the market's gotten so much better, properties are selling for higher cap rate has dropped. Let's say the cap rate is now 6%. So $425,000 net operating income. So we increased it divided by 6%. The value of the property is now 7 million. So we brought it from 4.2 million up to 7 million. We're selling it for about 6.7. So pretty close on the math, but that's essentially how it works is you get the income up, you get the NOI up, you increase the value of your property. You can sell it for more. Which is you have full control. It's not speculation. It's, it's investing. Not speculation. There is, control, you know, the rest is taken well, out of it. It, well, here's the thing is that it, there is risk because, you know, there could be other shit that happens. God knows. Yeah, let's say the market uh, crashes and the cap rate's not 6%. Maybe it's 8.5% and my value goes down, right? So there is there is some there, but my ca but I, my cash flow is there, right? As long as I project and I have enough cash flow to cover all my expenses and we're making money, I'm safe. I don't need to sell the property. I've got a 10-year loan. But well, here's the thing. It's a calculated risk. Calculated risk. It is, it's a right. risk, mm -hmm. but it's a calculated risk. And mm -hmm. I tell people, I'm a fucking investor. I'm not a gambler. Nope. I'm not yeah. going to buy that shit because I think at some point, if I do this, maybe this, oh shit, something might happen. Fuck you. You do your research. Fuck you. I'm buying it because I know that if I yeah. do this, this is yep. going to happen. I know that. Now, there's always variables out there that can switch out your shit, but it doesn't fucking matter. Like, you, it's a risk, but it's a calculated risk. And that's where people get it all jacked up. Oh, I don't want it to be a risky investment. You know what's risky? Leaving that shit sitting in your goddamn fucking savings account, getting yep. 0 0.01% or whatever the fucking bullshit yep. they're giving you <laughs> right now. Yeah, Exactly, dude. Because in multifamily, exactly. when things don't go right, you just make less money. You know what I mean? Like, if you buy it right, really... yeah, if you buy it right. It's literally all about buying it right, you know? If you buy any property right, you should be able to weather any storm. You should be totally fine. You should make money no matter what happens with the market, especially if you're buying decent areas. Man, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Are we, we got... going to talk Cabo or what? Well, we, we, we'll talk Cabo <laughs> here in a second. We got Chris uh, who's saying that's just insane. I am jealous. Man, that Dude, is don't crazy. Be jealous, man. Go work. Yeah, so, go get, go well, get so it. Was, was that your first time over in, uh, in Mexico, first time over in Cabo? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, actually, I was in Cabo for a wedding, oddly enough, two months ago. So it was weird within a short time period. But yeah, this year. Nice. First time. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about that mastermind. Yeah, I know you're a big networker. You went down there to network, Go guys. Yeah. Yeah. Network, network, network. Hold on. Before you start sharing your story there, David. Guys, if you want to let network with higher level individuals, go where higher level individuals hang out. Yes. It's not fucking rocket science. Now, Amen. I will tell you this from personal experience that we're highly successful people hang out. Normally, it's hard to get. <laughs> hard to get yeah. into. And it's usually going to cost you a pretty fucking penny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> fake it till you make it. But, it. but it's there. And you know what? You don't even have to fake it. One of the best no, things that I did in my networking is, hey, my name is Brian. I ain't got shit. <laughs> no, yeah, dude. How can I help you? Exactly. How can I help you? Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, tell us about this uh, this mastermind thing that you went to. So I met a guy networking at uh, a Rod Cleef event. If you guys heard of Rod Cleef, he's a big um, he's got a big podcast for apartments, and he does these events around the country. So I met a guy. His name's Kevin Easterly. You guys should have him on the show. He's a pretty cool, dude. Yeah. Um, and he owns some apartments and franchises. He's like, dude, we should start this Facebook group because there I think there's something lacking here, right? So. We started a Facebook group. We we got up to, we're at about 1,200 people now just since November. And it's all focused on apartments. And since he does franchises, we talk about franchises too and how you can like make cash flow franchises funnel in apartments. So we started this group, long story short. And we decided, hey, let's get all these people together. 
I know there's all these masterminds going on now, which where everyone's just in a conference room and, and it's, you know, sometimes a little dry and, I, and I'm in involved in a couple of them and I love them. They're hugely helpful, but we wanted to just do something a little bit different. So we're like, let's give people, you know, an opportunity to network with really high level entrepreneurs, but let's also give them the most badass experience of their lives. So plan this trip to Cabo. We had about 25 people. We booked this boutique hotel. Uh, we're there from, you know, last Thursday to Sunday and, uh, you know, all day Friday, we got in there Thursday, all day Friday, we did networking. We had a couple sessions where me and my buddy spoke on some topics like focus and, and all these things that you guys are joining into, which is so important. And, uh, then Saturday, uh, we booked a, a big boat. We got 125, what was it? it was bigger than the boat. We got 125 foot yacht and we all went out and chilled on it all day. I nice. uh, just had a blast, built some great relationships and, and had a lot of fun. So, well, speaking yeah. about chilling in a yacht, I actually got my man, TJ Hines over here. Um, I spoke at an event a few months nice. ago in Miami. Uh, he was one of the speakers, but one of the things that we did over there is they rented out a hundred foot yacht or some shit like Dude, that. Dude, nice. In Miami. Uh, oh, it's cool. You know, it was, it was cool, but it was, it was one of these things where you're sitting there you're hanging out with other six and seven figure earners. You're all chilling. And you know, I say this shit all the fucking time. The majority of my money is made smoking weed, drinking alcohol and eating food with people. <laughs> that's awesome. Because it's the fucking truth. It's the that's truth. How you, that's how you connect with people the most. Hey, Amen, dude. Start, you know, the, the boardrooms and sitting there and everything like that's fine. But it's usually, even when you go to those boardrooms, the majority of your money is going to be made in the breaks. The majority of your money is going to be during the lunch. The majority of your money is going to be in the in the after the event happy hour shit that they have. That is really where the majority of your money is going to be. Totally is. It totally is, dude. And we didn't even make any money on this trip. I had to come like three grand out of pocket uh, to put it on, but it doesn't. It didn't matter to me because I got all these people together. I think a lot of them went back. I know a lot of them went back and now are changing their businesses around. And hopefully it changed a lot of their lives and they got a ton out of it. Uh, and now we're planning another one for um, September. So we're going to go to, I don't know where we're going yet. Some kind of exotic location like Hawaii, Belize, Costa Rica. I don't know. Yeah. We haven't decided yet. Costa Rica. Releasing. We talked about this. Oh right? my God. Costa yes. Rica. You haven't been, right? Yeah. What's uh, that? No. You haven't been to Costa Rica. So oh, yeah. yeah. I told, I, I'm going to tell you just like I told this motherfucker and he came back, but either way, Costa Rica will change your fucking life. Like you're I not going to come back the same from Costa Rica. There's a certain vibe over there. There's a certain energy with the people. Yeah. Um, the best way that I can tell that the best way that I can explain it is like the government has brainwashed their people <laughs> to be nothing but happy, go lucky, wow. awesome, amazing individuals. I need to go. It's a culture thing. It's it's That's right. It's just, it's just awesome. Everybody's happy. Awesome. Everybody is happy all the fucking time. And, wow. and their national slogan is pura vida, pura which vida. translates to just pure life. So it's yeah. like, hey Chris, how's it going, man? Good, good, good to see you, man. Yeah, pura man. vida, pura vida. Like everybody, <laughs> hey, hey, pura vida. Like it's 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 so ingrained in their culture, bro. Do it in Costa Rica. You and won't it, regret it. And That's in September, awesome. I believe it's the rainy season on the Pacific side. So you're going to want to be on yeah. the Caribbean side. So you're going to have a Jamaican and, feel. And right? in my experience, the Caribbean side is much nicer. The, the it, Pacific side is where they do all the touristy shit, all the big resorts and the, the fucking cruise ships come down and stuff. The, um, the Caribbean side, oh, man, it's awesome. It's amazing. And they have these Rastafarian type hippie beach towns nice. the, the oh yeah is that like going... Haco? have you heard of Haco? Huh? you know Haco? Uh, yeah 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 it's just a little bit south of there actually okay i have an yeah. investor that owns a bunch of stuff down there but um yeah he says it's amazing so i want to go i'm telling you man it will completely change <laughs> your life so anyway we got uh we got justin Lieber who's saying i'm in hawaii let me know if you guys need hookups oh shit i'm gonna definitely Hell yeah. call when we there we got TJ Hines saying 420 is here, kid. Fuck yeah. <laughs> 420 all that's day, right. every day. Uh, is, that, is that tomorrow? Today's today? 419. Oh, shit. Tomorrow. Dude, I don't even know my fucking days are all fucked up. We need, uh, Chris said, we need some some of that happy brainwashing shit in California. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, guys, you know, this is why you travel. 
And and honestly, dude, you're a young cat. I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest to you the same thing that I told my son. Like, I don't give a fuck what you do, just travel. Just travel. Get to totally. know yourself by traveling. Preferably travel alone. Now it's cool to go with friends and shit like that, but if you can travel alone, especially to a different country where you don't know anybody, yeah. specifically if you don't know the fucking language, like man, you start finding out all these things about you. Speaking of somebody who's doing that, da, 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 I am. <laughs> there you go, bro. He's here in two yeah. weeks. Dude, uh, I don't know the fucking language. Uh, I I do know somebody over there, but outside of that, I'm just gonna be figuring this shit out. And I'm telling you, as I'm telling everybody else, when you go there and you see how other people live in other countries. You see what they have to go through. You see how little they have versus how happy they are. And then you contrast that to how much we have versus how unhappy we are. Uh, things just start shifting in your head, in your it's mind. Insane, dude. Really, really, Well, that's why we put together this event, right? Is we're going to do try and do it two, three times a year. And it's going to allow us to travel the world with just incredible groups of people and get people, you know, level up. Everyone can level up together. And so that's okay. the goal. And exactly. If you're going, I mean, if you're going to be doing these networking events, that's the great portion of it. That's one of these things where when you learn to network, you're able to connect people together. And how can we grow? And uh, what, what is that saying? Uh, rising tides rise all ships or something like yeah. that. Yep. So something along those lines. All when the, you all raise, those rise with yep. the tide. Yeah. You, you just you elevate everybody. And this is why you spend the money to go to these networking events. We got yeah. uh, we got Greg Cook who's saying "Where's my badge?" We got uh, <laughs> T.J. Hines saying "Chris and Brian uh, knocking it out the park, fellas." Truly, truly appreciate you. We got Craig Gill who says, "I just returned from a trip in Germany to network with group interested in investing in the states," and that's Beautiful. a whole different thing that we're not going to wow. get into today. But we've actually met people that have investors out of the country, uh, actually. Yeah. Not TJ, but somebody else who was speaking at the event where I met or where I met TJ first face to face for the first time. Uh, this guy was actually raising a lot of money from overseas. So there's a lot of different places. Yeah, I have several may, from Israel. Exactly. You may be like, oh, man, you know, nobody that I know has money. Well, who fuck? Fuck the people that you go know. Go meet, go meet other go people. Go yeah. meet other people. Now, speaking exactly. of meeting new people, David, uh, you said you're about to be relocating. Is Was it to Austin? Yeah. So, okay. What's so there? I guess the, the next, yeah. So the next part, I guess, of my story after I, I bought the, that last property I told you about is um, I split with my original business partner, the one we bought those first three properties with. And I went all last year, just kind of figuring out what, you know, what do I want to do? I wanted to keep focusing on apartments. And so I met a guy, his name is Glenn Gonzalez. He's now my business partner. I'm out of obsidian capital and he's been in the industry for about 30 years now, he started off as a maintenance guy when he was 23 and he worked his way up to own almost 5,000 apartment units in the last couple of years. He went through the same thing. He split with a business partner for pretty much the same reasons I did. And uh, we ended up really getting along, seeing eye to eye. And I met him through one of these masterminds I'm involved in uh, called the multifamily boardroom with Rod Cleef. And he just liked my hustle. Uh, he liked that I already had some experience and we just decided, Hey, let's, let's go buy a deal together. See how it goes. So me and him bought a property in Houston, uh, it was 160 units. This is, um, several months back. And then we just decided, Hey, let's, let's partner on our business going forward. So he's based out of Austin. We've since bought a couple more properties together. I just closed on a piece of land with him today. Uh, we closed on Cobble Hill apartments in Fort Worth on Monday and we're working on a couple more projects right now, a little new development in Austin. So um, I decided I don't have a girlfriend or any kids or anything hold me back. I'll just move down okay. there and oh, get the, the hell out of going to be knocking pretty yeah. soon, man. And guys, this is why <laughs> you do it when you're younger. That's right. You know, having a wife does not make this business <laughs> possible. It just makes it a little yeah. harder. <laughs> having kids does not make this business impossible. It just makes it a little harder. <laughs> having other commitments and other, other things that keep you there – uh, don't make this business impossible. They just make it harder. But being able to just get up and go and say, hey, you know what? I see opportunity here. That's something that a lot of people don't do. And there's a lot of people that wish. And dude, if you have somebody like a girlfriend or something that's not that supportive, yeah. I, I when I first started, I, after a year in, I broke up with a girlfriend because she wasn't, I was with her for two and a half years, but was not supportive enough, supportive enough and didn't see the same vision as I did. So I broke up with her. I, I split with a lot of my old friends 
just because I, I knew what I needed to be around for that vision. And I think a lot of I people had, out there are in the same situation. They just, you got a girlfriend when I first started who was extremely supportive. She just wasn't growing in the right direction that I, the same direction that I was going. She sure. just wasn't growing in the pace that I was growing. And eventually sure. I had to do her a favor and break up with, cause I was like, dude, I'm just, gonna, that was exactly how it was. I'm, I'm going to exactly. outrun your ass here. Like I'm going to outgrow your shit and it's not going to be very comfortable for either one of us. So guys, you know, we talked about all these things that he's done. You know, he started off at the young age of 20 or so 21. He decided to jump into the business. He had no experience and said, you know what? I I've done a few wholesales, but this is just like a job. And this is something that we talk about all the time. At the end of the show, we always say flip for cash and hold for wealth. But it's still a job when you're flipping, when you're new building, when you're when you're uh, wholesaling, when you're when you're doing all these stuff. If you don't do the next one, you're never going to get the next fucking check. Then you just you yep. put yourself into this goddamn fucking cycle where all the fucking time everybody's just circling around the same shit. So you you, you realize that you said, I want to move into multifamily. You had the balls to, you had the discipline to go ahead and focus just on multifamily and say, let me not surround myself with people that are not in multifamily. I only want to talk to people in multifamily. I only want to do multifamily. That is what I have committed myself to do. Then you had the balls to actually follow through with it, not let the naysayers, not let your own bullshit in your mind talk you out of it about, oh, you don't have any money, you're too young, you don't have no experience, you've never done this, X, Y, Z. You, you said, you know what, fuck this shit, I'm gonna do this shit anyways. You took that upon yourself, you jumped through the challenges, and then once you made it, you decided, hey, you know what, I can do whatever the fuck I want, and I wanna do a little bit more of this, so I'm making the move to a different state so I can focus a little bit more on it with my business partners. Kudos to yeah. you, man. Kudos to you for, for getting rid of the girlfriend. Uh, serious. A lot of times people, whether it's, whether it's relationships, whether it's friends or family, a lot of times people don't know how to cut those ties and they keep some down. There are those fucking sure. anchors that are going to just completely hold you down. So it's kudos huge. to you for doing that, man. Kudos to you for following your dreams. Kudos to you for being such an inspiration to a lot of people. I know that there's going to be a lot of people that are watching here right now. I got, look, fucking Earl says, I need to get my act together. Boom. When you Y'all start do. doing things, people, whether you know it or not, you inspire them. I had a, um, so I told you I go, uh, I go sunrise hiking, right? Nice. I, there was a few people who said, hey, I want to go with you. And I said, well, meet me at this mountain at this time. Most of these motherfuckers not only didn't show up, but didn't even text to say, hey, I'm not going to show up or any of this shit. Right. So I was a little bit upset. And I, as my way to discourage anybody else from ever fucking asking to go hiking with me, because I don't want you to waste my goddamn time and mess up my, my morning routine of hiking, on, uh, meditating on top of the mountain. I put a post and I said, hey, you know what? Don't, don't fucking, don't do this shit unless you're going to do whatever, whatever, right? So that was my intention was just to let people know not to fuck with me, not to go ahead and waste my time, not to even ask me to go hiking in the morning because that's my personal private time. Um, what happened from there was somebody else that I'm doing a, a, a apartment complex deal with. She messaged me and she said, hey, something, something about the apartment. Oh, by the way, your post today inspired me to get up and ride my bike. The fact that I saw you go up and hiking in the morning, that, that reminded me that I committed to uh, working out on myself a little bit more. And that's going to, so even though my post was not intended to inspire people to go get up in the morning and do that shit, that reminded somebody. So just thank, thanks, thanks for being a huge inspiration. I know that a lot of people that are going to be watching the replays, a lot of people that are going to be hearing the podcast, a lot of people that are going to be watching this on YouTube, and even the people that are watching it here live, you know, we a lot of people have said, man, what an inspiration. Uh, and just it just goes to show what you can do if you put your mind to it, if you focus on it, if you network with the right people, and you take the right actionable steps. Um, we got a great cook here who's saying anybody wants an RV mobile home park uh, near Florida, send me the information. We'll talk about that, Greg. Um, uh, let me see, Chris, I'm going with you when I get home, like it or not. Perfect. Uh, and you know what? There was a few people that said that were asking about your next event. So whenever you do 
come up with oh, yeah. uh, your your next event, let us know. We'll definitely put it out there for yeah. Oh, yeah. listeners who want. I appreciate to that because guys, we say this all the time. It's all about networking. But if you go to the free networking event down the fucking street, or if you go to the event where you pay five grand between your fucking ticket, flight, and everything else to go, plus not counting the amount of money that you're not making for whatever many days you're there for traveling and everything else. And normally when I travel somewhere, because I'm in Phoenix, I normally travel from Phoenix to a HUD, whether it be like LA or Houston or Dallas or Miami or whatever. So if I like the city, I normally like to spend a day or two there. Anyway, all that shit adds up. But the people that do that are the same people that are going to be at that mastermind, which are going to be that you're going to be leveling with the much higher crowd yeah. of individuals. So if you, you have to spend a lot of time networking, exactly. Yeah. If you guys are looking to get your shit together, if you guys are looking to step out of your zone, if you guys are looking to surround yourself with other people, do like what our buddy Greg Cook did. If he wants to get into multifamily, we said, hey man, go check out Corey Peterson's Co- Kahuna Boardroom. That's something that Chris and myself had gone to. That's something that we found a lot of value. Guess what he did? He actually booked the fucking ticket. Uh, his ticket, his price are not fucking cheap for that class. He booked the ticket to come to Arizona. He spent the money on the hotel. He did what he had to do. And now he's moving into that field by networking and surrounding yourself. So anyway, Dave, man, you are an amazing individual. I'm so glad that I got to interview you today. Thank God for uh, Instagram. Man. Thank God for Instagram. <laughs> I didn't even know who you were. I know you guys are awesome. I, I mean, this is a lot of fun and I appreciate yeah, so, it. So, so David, yes. if you're not following me on Instagram, make sure that you follow me at cashflow creator. If any of you guys okay. are not following us on Instagram at cashflow, Chris with the K. So Chris with the K cashflow, Chris at cashflow creator, David, what's your Instagram? Uh, it's real estate Jedi, like star Wars Jedi. Nice. Dude, you see, <laughs> then, you see uh, the fucking, you see the trailer for the new one? No, I haven't. Did it oh, come out? Oh man, they, they just released that shit like two days ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, bro, that shit is sick. Dude, holy fuck, dude! Up. Holy fuck, I'm excited for that. Oh, that's the one. Yeah, nerd, yeah, talk. Check it out. nerd talk, nerd yeah, talk. Like, so anyway, real, uh, say say your uh, say your handle again. <laughs> yeah, it's real estate at real estate Jedi, and then Perfect. you can find me on Facebook. I think it's at real David Tupin. Um, you know, my Facebook group's called 10X Apartment Investing and Franchise Mastery. You can find my website, obsidiancapitalco.com. Uh, guys, yeah. just like always, we'll go ahead and put the, this information on the show notes. So we'll Sweet. go back, we'll grab that information. But you can oh, find yeah. him on his Instagram. I'm assuming that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of Yeah, him. I love Instagram's the best. DM yeah, me, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Too old for Facebook. Too, too young for Facebook. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, David, once again, I really want to uh, just want to tell you how much we appreciate your time. Thanks, man. We appreciate you coming in there. I know that there's a lot of people that are going to get a lot of value from all I hope so. facts of life. And, and dude, just once again, big kudos to you for being for being aware, for being mindful, for being able to foresee what you want, for having the discipline to stick with it at such a young age, because a lot of times most people don't learn those lessons. They don't even understand that they have to do that shit till they're way, way older than you. So the fact that you not only understand those things, but are doing it and doing it to the level that you're doing it is just fucking amazing, man. So I David, appreciate that. Really, Thank really you so appreciate much. Appreciate you there. Uh, any of you guys here, once again, if you guys are, have been watching this, if you guys are watching this on a replay, if you guys are catching us on a podcast, if you guys are watching us on YouTube, make sure they, and you found this of value, make sure that you share this with your friends. As I said, guys, we don't pitch anything. We don't sell anything. We're not promoting anything. We're just adding value to you. So if you find this of benefit, make sure that you add value. If you listen to this and you and you want to, if you're catching it live and you want to hear the replay, because there's some things that David talked about and you kind of didn't get a chance to get notes, you want to go re- replay. A lot of times it's easier to download the podcast. You can find us under Flipping Fridays on iTunes. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on Podbean. You know, a lot of times I find it myself, find it easier to, to hear because I, I always rehear my own shows, but I find it easier to hear it on a podcast setting as opposed to, you know, taking an hour, hour and a half and watching the video. So anyway, guys, make sure that you do that and make sure that you give us a five-star review. Uh, Cashflow Chris, 
this has been a fucking awesome show. Amazing. You guys awesome. Are awesome show. David, thanks so much, man. Is there anything else that you wanted to leave our, our viewers with? No, I just think this is really cool what you guys do. You guys are a lot of fun. You keep it really chill. And I think there's a lot of people that are going to get a ton of value from what you guys are doing. Yeah, they, so keep it up, man. Because like I said, wait, I didn't know fucking know David beforehand. He, he didn't know who <laughs> I was either. So he's like, you know, how, how is the show going to go? Like, you know, is it going to be like formal or like fun? I was like, yeah. formal? Nah. <laughs> not, the, not the edu. <laughs> not the AZ flip, guys, man. Edu take. Yeah. Edu love it. As I said, guys, and this is, if you guys are so, hearing this on a podcast or on a replay, this is why you want to join us live to be able to join the fun. So catch us every single Friday, Friday at noon, Arizona time. Once again, that is Cashflow Chris. This is Cashflow Creator. We got our good boy at Real Estate Ninja. Uh, Jedi, Jedi. Oh, God damn it, at Real Estate Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, Jedi. we all want to remind you to flip for cash. But do yourself a fucking favor and make sure you start holding for wealth. That's right. Yeah, All right. buddy. All right, guys. All right, David. Hey, Pleasure bro. meeting you, man. Thank you. Thank you so Later, much. Later, guys. <laughs>